We're going to start by reading God's word again. And just like the previous times, I always read the letter in full because it's such a short letter. So, and it gives us a bit uh, uh, more context of what's happening in the letter, especially as uh, we're going to discover a bit more about um, Philemon, Onesimus, Paul, and how they come about to be in this position. And why is the intent of this letter? Why do we have it in the Bible? So let's read Philemon, starting in verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our dear friend and fellow worker, to Aphia, our sister, to Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church that meets in your home. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I always thank my God as I remember you in my prayers because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith so that you will have a full understanding of every good thing we have in Christ. Your love is given great joy and encouragement because you, brother, have refreshed the hearts of the saints. Therefore, although in Christ I could be bold and order you to do what you ought to do, yet I appeal to you on the basis of love. I then, as Paul, an old man, and now also a prisoner of Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my son, Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. I am sending him, who is my very heart, back to you. I would have liked to keep him with me so that he could take your place in helping me while I am in chains for the gospel, but I did not want to do anything without your consent so that any favor you do will be spontaneous and not forced. Perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back for good, no longer as a slave, but better than a slave, as a dear brother. He's very dear to me, but even dearer to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he has done you any wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I, Paul, I'm writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back. Not to mention that you owe me your very self. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. And one thing more, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Let's pray. Dear Father, as we think about this letter now, I pray, Lord, that you would show us what you want us to learn, what you want us to apply to our hearts, that we, become, that we can become more like your son. Help us to understand what forgiveness is what it looks to you, what the Christ-honoring biblical forgiveness looks like so that we can imitate you just as you forgave us. Help me, Lord, to be clear. Help the people to be receptive, Lord. Give them ears to hear and hearts to receive and, and a faith that will apply these things to their lives as, as we will find struggles. We, would be, we will be offended. We will offend. So help us to be more like you in this way. So be with us now as we draw close to you. Draw close to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this is the third part that I've been preaching in the letter um, to Philemon. And this letter was written by the Apostle Paul. If you remember, the Apostle Paul uh, was converted in uh, Acts uh, chapter 9 as he was persecuting Christians. He was actually a religious man, taught even by a prominent religious leader called Gamaliel back in those days. And he was after he was after the Christians for following the way, for having uh, this Jesus saying that Jesus was a Messiah. And we read a bit about him, of how he was converted on his road on the road to Damascus to to actually uh, imprison Christians, to go after Christians, and how the Lord then miraculously blinded him and told him, why are you persecuting me? Identifying his body of believers as personal attack on Christ himself. And since then, Paul was changed, scales off his eyes. He was actually blind uh, for a few days, but then God said he was going to use them to reach the Gentiles, to be a, an apostle to the Gentiles. And as he was going on his ministry in the streets of um, Rome, 
uh, a lot of Jews starting seeing this um, former Jewish leader uh, causing quite a stir in the Jewish community. You see, they were accusing him of taking these Greeks to the temple. And a lot of people in Rome were after him. And this caused the Roman guards to say, what's going on? What's happening here? So they, they, they seized Paul. They're now inquiring with the Jewish people that want to have this man killed. Apparently he's breaking the law. And then the Romans realize, hey, wait a minute. This has nothing to do with Roman law. This is something to do with your law, with your religious Jewish law. So you should go back to Jerusalem and sort yourselves out. And Roman says, is this how you treat a Roman citizen? He appeals to his Roman citizenship. And in those days, if you're a Roman citizen, you could appeal to Caesar by that time with Nero and have a trial. And he saw he did that. He appealed. I want to have a word with Caesar because of, the, of, of, of what they're charging me with. And then we find out Felix and, uh, and other Roman procurators listen to what he has to say. And they put him in custody. So he put him in custody to, to, be, uh, to have a trial with Caesar for two years under house arrest. And this is the time now that Paul's writing this letter, you see, because what happened was Onesimus was, run away, was a slave that belonged to this Philemon. And Philemon was a, a man that has come under Paul's ministry, probably heard Paul teach and, and, and was saved under Paul's ministry. And now Onesimus finds himself serving Paul in prison under house arrest. And guess what? He was saved. He came under Paul's influence, just like his master, but his master didn't know this. And now Paul sees himself benefiting greatly from Onesimus. And now he says to himself, uh, we need to tell your master. And maybe Onesimus even probably told him, I want to be reconciled to my master. And now what's happening is Paul is pleading with a master, Philemon. He's going to write this letter and say, he's a changed man. You should accept him as you accept me. And we're going to learn a bit about this last section of Philemon because uh, the first part, uh, when we uh, last time uh, started, the first time actually was a few, maybe a month ago now, we started on the book of, of the letter of Philemon. We've learned something about Philemon's character. So the first section of, of the first seven verses of the letter of Philemon, we've learned about the character of Philemon because Paul is writing there, speaking about, I hear the love you have and the faith you have. I hear the love for the saints. I hear you. Are you refreshing the hearts of the saints? I hear of your love to all the believers. So he's seeing his love impact others. He says, this is, I hear Onesimus maybe, or Onesimus is telling me that you're a loving person. You, you are opening your home. We actually find out that he's hosting the house church at Colossae, you see, because Philemon was living in Colossae and he was hosting this church at his home. Right? So he's writing not only to Philemon, because we see addressed in the first verses, that he's also saying, and to your home, that, that, that the church that meets at your home. So the people will find out about this Onesimus. Maybe they know about him. Maybe uh, they know about the events. We know that Colossians, what happens was Tychicus was a man that was sent. Tychicus is a man that sent with this letter, together with Onesimus, to deliver to the Colossian church and to the Philemon. And we said that... Um, that, uh, that, that Paul says, listen, Onesimus is coming with you as well, and he's one of you. So it assumes, it assumes that he wants them, Onesimus, to be the long of this flock that meets in this master's house. But I was uh, recapping, uh, uh, as I was recapping the first part of the letter, Paul wanting us, wanted us to know the character of Philemon. So we were learning about, okay, Philemon is loving to others and faithful to God. Secondly, we've learned that Philemon was a teachable person because he was saying uh, that he will, that this partnership that they have would deepen his understanding of all that they share in Christ. So he was saying, listen, this is an opportunity for you to grow, to mature in Christ. You see, see this above uh, human circumstances. Uh, forgiveness is an opportunity to grow. That's what we've learned last time. And lastly, on the first verse seven, we've learned that he was refreshing the hearts of the saints. He was opening his house to believers. You see, he has a guest room that not only for Paul, which he's going to ask for later on in the, in the, in the passage, but we've, we've learned that he was using his house not only to meet, but also to refresh the Lord's people. And then secondly, a week after or two weeks after, we've looked at the second part from verses eight to 16. And then we, Paul moves from um, Philemon's reputation and character, saying, this is what I hear about how you are. And he moves on to prompt, 
to plead with Philemon, basically to give him four incentives in order for him to be a quick forgiver, so to speak. And we've learned that he was saying to him, listen, in verse nine, do this on the basis of love. Forgive on the basis of love. Basically, listen, this is an opportunity for you to display Christian love. He was trying to plead with him, to with Philemon, to forgive his slave. Secondly, he said, listen, you might look at the blessings he may bring. He's saying, look, he was useless to you, but now he's useful. This slave of yours, because the name Onesimus actually means useless in the Greek. So he's saying, although he was useless to you, now he's actually useful. He's living up to his name. Okay. And then uh, thirdly, we looked at the verses 12 to 14, and we understood that Paul was trying to say, listen, look at the opportunities you might create. Uh, I would love to have him back. I would love for you to do even more, but I don't want it to do it. I don't want you to do it out of compulsion. Okay. Forgiveness can't be forced. Obedience can't be forced. Do it um, out of voluntary or spontaneous. Some of your, your um, uh, texts might say spontaneous. Some of them might say voluntary. So basically saying, listen, you're no longer trapped to the past. You're free now. You know, it opens doors. So see this as an opportunity, a change relationship. People will be affected around you, right? And then lastly said, and listen, who knows? Maybe you were separated for this reason. So I said, recognize that there's divine purpose in this. God is in working this out. He said, maybe this is the reason why he was separated from you. No longer to be seen as a slave, but as a brother. So this will impact the community around them. It will impact the church around it. So as we now come to the last section, we're going to be looking at the last section of Philemon. Uh, look, so first of all, we saw the character of a forgiving person. We try to imitate those, emulate those qualities. One that is faithful to God and loving to others, teachable, proactive in sharing the, their faith and their things they have. Secondly, we saw four incentives to help us to quickly forgive. Um, but now... The last is going to be the expectations. Now this is Paul saying, this is what I expect you to do, Philemon. And we're going to find out what are Paul's expectations. What does the Apostle Paul expect Philemon to do, to behave like, or to even to change? I mentioned on a previous message of what unbiblically worldly forgiveness looks like. And we all are guilty of it. Okay. Um, we say we accept someone's apologies. We accept someone's apologies, but we don't want to do want to do much with that person. We don't look them in the eyes sometimes. We uh, avoid them, eye contact, maybe refuse their calls or lengthy conversations. We um, sometimes even hold resentment and jealousy and, and, and bitterness. And we've learned that unforgiveness uh, entraps you to the past. It hinders your fellowship with God. It, it, it makes you bitter. Uh, so unforgiveness is not healthy. It's not Christian-like. And we're all guilty of it. And we thank the Lord that he doesn't treat us like that, you see, because when he forgives us, he wants to be with us. When he forgives us, he, he forgives our sins. They're, they are remembered no more. He desires our presence. He, he actually says he prepares us a room for he is that where, we, where he is, we can be with him. He gave his life. So there's no love better than this, than a friend laid down his life for another. And he calls us to love God and love neighbor. So there's the two greatest commandments uh, that he has given us. And forgiveness <laughs> is characteristic of a Christian person because you are more like Christ when you forgive, you see. So now we're going to, I want us to ponder on a question. Uh, as we draw our attention to this last section of the book of Philemon, I want us to question this, to have this question in our mind. How do we know, how do we know if we really have forgiven someone biblically. How do we know? Is there a way to know that we really have forgiven someone biblically? The Apostle Paul will lay out now at least four expectations that will be true of biblical Christ-honoring forgiveness. I encourage you to make a self-assessment and see if you meet these expect expectations. So the next time you forgive someone, you will know if it is in fact true God-honoring forgiveness. Four expectations. So how do you know if you have forgiven someone biblically? First expectation found in verse 17. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you welcome me. So first expectation, your attitude towards that person needs to change. So that's the first expectation. Paul is expecting Philemon to have a changed attitude towards this life. 
And it's the same for us. You will know if you have biblically forgiven someone, if your attitude is not the same, if you change your attitude, you see. And if you see in the first uh, part of the verse 17, partner. So if you consider me a partner, and that partner is the same root as the word found in verse 6 as sharing. Some translations it might even have partnership. So he's alluding, listen, we're all in this together. You know, Roman sees his, him as a slave. God sees him as a brother. Okay, I'm your partner. So if you consider me a partner, we're all in this together. We're in the gospel work. I'm in chains because of this. You're opening your house. I hear that you're faithful and loving to others. You have your role to play. I have my role to play. If you consider me a partner, then just receive an SMS like you would receive me. Have you been in situations where maybe you be easily offended by someone you know, but not easily offended by someone you respect highly? You see, maybe like a Stuart Elliott might say something that if my wife had said it, I'd be offended because I respect him highly, you see. But Paul is saying, I'm an apostle. I know I could be bold enough to tell you what to do. He tells us so in the, in the first verses. I could be bold as an apostle on behalf of Christ to tell you, you must forgive your brother. But he's now saying, listen, we're all in this together. We're no longer, we're all slaves to Christ, really, if you think about it. Because Onesimus is not a slave to you. He's a slave to Christ. So as I'm a slave to Christ, I'm a prisoner of Christ, like he says in the first opening statement. And so are you. And, you know, it is a bit of partiality or favoritism, isn't it? If you are quicker to forgive other people just because you respect them. And James warns us against that favoritism, doesn't he? When the rich people were coming into the assembly. We read in, Matt, in James chapter 2, verses 8 to 9, he says, if you really fulfill the royal law stated in scriptures, love your neighbor, uh, sorry, love your neighbor as yourself, right? you are doing well. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the lowest transgressors. And he carries on saying, my brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. So Paul is saying, Onesimus is the same as me. Is it the same rank as me? I know I'm an apostle sent by Christ. But if you really consider me a partner, if you really respect me this highly, if you really, really love the brothers like I hear you do, then extend this love to, my, to your slave, Onesimus. Okay? And like I was saying before, Roman culture sees Onesimus as a slave, a fugitive. And you know what? They could be punished by death if they were found these Roman slaves run away. They could be punished by death. And he says, listen, the culture thinks that what Onesimus has done is, unforgiv is unforgivable. But we're in a higher law. We're partners in this. Consider him. Your attitude should be the same as you would consider me. If you really consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. Okay? So our view of believers should be Christ's view of believers. If we have people that offended us, this is one way that we can identify if we really have forgiven someone. Because if our attitude is not the same and has not changed, that means we have not forgiven that person. And Paul is uh, expecting that from Philemon. And you, you can always hear, and I think Paul is anticipating Philemon saying, but, but did you know what he did? Do you know how he hurt me and the things he stole or the things? And then he says on the next verse, Listen, if he has done any wrong or owes you anything, verse 18, charge it to me. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. So how do you know if you have forgiven someone biblically? Second expectation. Were you willing to resolve any consequences? Were you willing to resolve any issues, any collateral damage that might have happened? The implication is, Onesimus might have caused some financial loss to his master. Think about it. If, if he really didn't run away, right? If he did really run away, he would have to survive on something. So he probably could have taken some valuables from his master Philemon. And that by, it could affect it, uh, not only the church, but the family. Uh, it could affect his reputation because he was a wealthy man. He had a house that he could share. So whatever wrong was done to Philemon, it was serious. Serious enough for Paul to put himself in there. He said, I personally take responsibility 
And of course, he reminds us of Christ, doesn't it? When he took our, the charge of our sins into himself. And you know what? When he says, I write this with my own hand. In those days, this could be legally binding, by the way. This letter could be legally binding like a promissory note saying, if you really did stole anything from you, I, this is my contract to you. Promise, I'm writing with my own hand. Promise note, I will pay it back. Charge it to me. Um, you might remember Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wanted to put things right. Sin, there are consequences with sin. There's collateral damage. And Zacchaeus, in Luke 19.8, if you remember, he climbed a sycamore tree because he wanted to see Jesus come. Jesus looks up to him and invites himself for dinner. And upon hearing Jesus, Zacchaeus says, and this is me quoting now, but Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if, if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. So he expects these issues to be resolved. There is no, like I mentioned, uh, buried, uh, shoveling things under the carpet. There's nothing like that in a Christian life. We remember maybe the price that David had to pay for his sins. He was forgiven. We read in Psalm 51 of his repentance against Bathsheba in Samuel, 2 Samuel 11. He sinned against Bathsheba, took someone else's wife, and has lost his son as a consequence. His family was divided. Absalom rebelled and was in the end killed, which caused him great sadness. It just goes to show that there are consequences to our sins. And whatever, um, how much is, is dependent on us, we are called to resolve these issues, to put it right, if it's dependent on us. Because, you know, sometimes imagine somebody might have offended you and caused you a financial loss, let's say. And they come back saying, oh, I'm sorry, here, I I'm willing to give back the money. And you say, no, 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 it's okay. But then you always have that in your mind when you see that person. Or another time he asks you for money or asks you to do the same thing. So you didn't resolve it, you see. Either you say it's okay and it's okay, you mean it, and you forget that whatever offense it was, or you're willing to, to resolve any attempts of reconciliation, of making things right. Just accept. So this is another expectation that he, he uh, that Paul is expecting Philemon to accept. He doesn't want any, any when he comes back there, he doesn't want to have any, any other issues that will affect the church around him or affect the relationship with Philemon and Onesimus. Because remember, the, the, the relationship they had before was one of a slave to his master. And he said, listen, any issues between yourselves, sort it out. And if there's any financial loss, I'll, I'll pay it back. Okay. So basically, wipe the slate clean, just like Christ did. He wipes the slate clean. He remembers our sins no more. And Corinthians says, the love keeps no records of wrongs. He hopes for the best, seeks the best of people. So he's saying... Be willing to resolve any issues. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I'll pay it back. And of course, he alludes to the spiritual now, because on the last part of verse 19, he says, not to mention, by the way, that you owe me your very self. Listen, when I remember when I told you in the beginning that Philemon heard Paul's preaching and was saved. So he's saying, listen, if he owes you, remember, you owe me. You see, he's saying not, of course, it's not him that personally saved it, but he's saying it's because of my ministry and my work and my service that the Lord saved you. Okay, so have that in account, okay? Because after on the next verse, he's saying, I'm confident of your obedience. He's not saying obedience to me, to Paul, because we've read in the beginning, he's saying, I want you to do things voluntary, not about compulsion. I was bold enough to say to you what you ought to do, but I want you to do it voluntarily. So he's saying, listen, you owe more than you can pay for in your salvation. So this shouldn't be a problem for you, okay? And if it is, charge it to me. So our application is, if you really want to know you biblically have forgiven someone, your attitude changed towards that person. Secondly, you were willing to resolve any collateral damage, any consequences. And then third, thirdly, we're going to read here on verse 20 and 21, Third expectation is, were you mindful of other people, of how impacted other people? Let's read verses 20, 21. I do wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I ask. 
So third expectation, you expect him, he expects Philemon to be mindful of how he will impact other people. We know that this is important to Apostle Paul. There's a lot of stake. There will be, but it will affect Paul. It will impact Paul. Though if Philemon wouldn't forgive, he expects him to forgive. But if he wouldn't, he wouldn't impact Paul. He wouldn't impact Onesimus. He wouldn't impact the church that meets at their house. Imagine the slave coming back with this letter of the apostle, this person that's really respectable, and he wouldn't forgive. He will affect everyone there. Sometimes we say, he sinned against me. And we are selfless. We focus on ourselves. It's done many harm. But that could affect the family. How are you going to treat your children? How are you going to treat other people? So always be thinking about how it will impact other people too, not just yourself. He's saying, listen, it will affect Onesimus. It will affect the church uh, because the Colossian church was meeting there. And of course, he says, um, you refresh the people. Back in the beginning of the verse, he says, you're refreshing the people. This is your character. Now refresh me. Put my mind to ease. We can find that Paul is basically very, very concerned. This is weighing in his mind. And he's saying, put my mind to rest. <laughs> refresh my heart. And there's a little play on the word benefit as well, you see. Because it does share the same root as the name of Nesimus. So there is a possibility he could be saying, I do wish, brother, that I might have some Onesimus from you in the Lord. Maybe, maybe implying, hey, you could set Onesimus back to continue serving me here. Because in the verses before, he says that he's, he's serving Paul and he's being faithful in serving Paul. He could be implying that, hinting that Onesimus come back. But do we know that he's confident that he will even do more than just forgive Onesimus? Which basically, if you think about it, what more can they do? He does. What more can Philemon do than forgive Onesimus? Well, maybe it will involve him in the church ministry there. He will now not be doing as much as he was doing before as seeing as a slave. If we, I don't know if uh, Paul was actually asking Philemon to say to him, listen, he's not a slave anymore. I don't know if he was trying to tell him, free him. But we know that he wanted to, him to treat him as a Christian brother. We know that for sure. So we can know that that will impact the way he treats an SMS will impact other people. Um, so, for example, what we can know is that whatever Philemon's going to do is going to impact other people and he's going to imitate Christ because he says in the Lord. Can you see he's, he's bringing the Lord into this matter? He says, I want to have to embrace with you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. He's saying, do this for Christ. And, I, and I'm obedient that you're going to do this for Christ. And maybe he will remind himself of Matthew 6, 14, 15. Jesus saying, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So Paul, in verse 21, expects Philemon to do even more than forgive. Not to be self-focused, but Christ-focused, church-focused. Many people would be influenced, affected by Philemon's actions. This is where the rubber meets the road, Philemon. This is, we'll see if you stand up for your name, if you actually are that loving person that I hear so much about, if you are mindful of others, if you are loving others and faithful to God. And we're going to find on the next verse, this is what Paul is going to be eager to see when he gets there, because he's going to say, and by the way, I'm planning to come and meet you. So he's going to be expecting this. He's going to be expecting that uh, Philemon not only has a changed attitude, not only that he was uh, mindful of others and uh, resolved any leftover collateral damage. But fourthly, that he won't be affecting his service the way he serves, that this won't be affecting his service. He's telling them and one more thing in verse 22, prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayer. So how do you know if you've biblically forgiven someone? Is it affecting the way your behavior, your service? When you're around that person, imagine if it's a brother in the church. He said, oh, I'm sorry for what I did. He said, oh, it's fine. It's fine. But then the church, you're like, oh, I don't want to be always oh, doing that ministry. I don't want to be in that ministry. Or always oh, serving coffee. So I'm going to wait because I want to be served by that person. So he's affecting not only your attitude, he's affecting your service. Because instead of being <laughs> at the church thinking about how I'm going to serve others, you're thinking about I'm going to avoid that person as much as I can. 
or I'm not going to be serving alongside that brother. So Paul is saying he's expecting to carry on. You, you, you have a guest room that you're using for others already that I know about. Hey, when I, when I come there, I expect you to basically, uh, can you share that room for me? So he expects him to carry on. Just press on. Forget forgiveness like Christ. He forgets our sins. You see, like I mentioned in the first message, we think the world thinks is forgiven but not forgotten. But we Christians think, no, it's forgiven and it's forgotten. It's like it never happened. And that's how we should behave. It shouldn't be affecting your service. And he's saying, we don't know. I, I don't think he did manage to get to, Col- to, Col- to Colossae and stay in the room because I think he was going to Spain afterwards, which was the opposite direction. But he was intending to go there. And that would put a bit of pressure, didn't you think? <laughs> Put a bit of pressure. Think about this. He's expecting you to have a change attitude. He's expecting you to have resolved any issues that are remaining whatsoever. And it reminds us of that verse in in a verse in the Gospels, which says about if you have something against your brother, leave the gift at the altar and be reconciled to your brother. And that's how you'll be presented to God in your service. Thirdly, were you mindful of how you impacted others, not just yourself? Are you self-focused when when it comes to forgiveness? Are you thinking about oh, actually, this is for the greater good? For Christ is, will honor Christ. It will, it will be a benefit to the church. And lastly, will it be affecting your service? Paul expects hospitality. And hospitality is love of strangers. It's highly commended. Maybe you remember Lydia in Acts 16, I think, when Lydia was by the river. She was a seller of purple goods. And Paul actually says, the Lord opened Lydia's heart to understand what Paul was saying. And then after she was saying, please, please come to my house. I want you to come to my house. And they said, oh, we were persuaded by it. It was a virtue. Hospitality, the love for strangers is a virtue. So he's saying, you carry on serving the Lord. Press on. Move on. If you're forgiven, move on with your life. And so it's up to us as well. If somebody has to apologize, and and for the best of your abilities, you recognize it was, you can't see a person's heart, right? You say, I, that's fine. We're good, brother. We're good. Oh, um, let me pay for this. Said, no, no, it's fine. It's fine. And you actually mean it. Then your attitude will be changed. And you, you've you been considered, I will impact him and also maybe the people he's, he's under and will impact you and your family and the church around you. And next time you see him, guess what? You won't stop talking to the person. You will go and out of your way and you will treat him better than before even, because that will, um, that will prove to that person that he's really forgiven, because this can go both ways. I'm, I'm stating here, how can you know you have forgiven someone biblically, but it can go the other way. How can you know you have been forgiven biblically? You can be on the other side. You can be saying, I've asked forgiveness from this person. How do I know if I really was forgiven? So you can do this assessment. You say, oh, does he change his attitude? Or is he... Is he changed with me? Is he is he now uh, is he around me? Is he okay to be around me? Is he mindful of me? Is it impacting the way we talk or the way we serve? So this can go both ways. Or even like Paul, you could be outside and see two brothers and assess the situation. Because Paul is seeing Onesimus and Philemon. He's coming in between them saying, this is what I expect. Onesimus wants to be reconciled, accept him back. Just like you accept me. You see, and uh, I don't want it to affect others. I want you to resolve anything. And by the way, I'm coming. So pressure's on. I'm coming to you. And I hope this is true when I get there, that this is Christian forgiveness. And by application, I can think we can find that uh, it's useful to us as well, even though it happened a long time ago. We have the letter for a purpose. We do think that he really didn't forgive. There's actually a... um, uh, how do I say, is it a tradition or a, a legend that apparently Onesimus was a bishop in a, a church in Ephesus. There, there's some, some writings of a slave, a former slave become a bishop of Onesimus. Of course, it's extra biblical evidence, but we don't know. We expect that Philemon did forgive because we have the letter here. And then, of course, we come to the end of the letter with uh, um, a farewell, saying, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings. So Epaphras was actually involved in planting the same church that Philemon was hosting. And Epaphras 
we believe, that he might have gone to Paul to tell him about the few issues that were happening at the church. But he'd stayed back with Paul. And he says, he sends you greetings. And so do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my fellow soldiers. The grace of the Lord Christ be with your spirit. Now, if you know Mark, Mark actually has let Paul down before, you see. Mark was the writer of the second gospel, and he had proved to be a faithful servant of the Lord after his early failure. And you can find that in, the few, in Acts 13, 13, and 15, 36, 39. So Mark has, uh, had failed to be with Paul, but he was now reconciled. So maybe he dragged him into this to say, listen, it happened to me. I've fallen out with Mark before, but now we're here together. And also Demas later, not at the moment, will forsake Paul, having loved this present world. We find that in 2 Timothy 4.10. So these people are together with Paul. They're helping the ministry. They're all partners in this gospel. Paul is saying, listen, Onesimus helped us here. I'm sending him back to you to be reconciled. Accept him. Accept him as you accept me. Have an attitude that's the same as you would me. Uh, resolve any conflicts. And, he, and if he owes you money, yes, I'll, I'll take the blame. I'll take the fall for him. So it gives a bit of an example to Philemon, how to be self-sacrificial, selfless. Because when we think about somebody offending us, we're always thinking about, what about me? What about me? What does this person think of me? And Paul is saying, this is bigger than you. Christ's reputation is on the line. Your reputation is on the line. My reputation is on the line. And Onesimus' reputation is on the line. This is bigger than you. Forgiveness is bigger than you. Okay? So have these four proofs, evidences, uh, evaluations when you're thinking about forgiveness. Somebody forgave you or you forgave someone. Think about, have I changed my attitude towards the person? Was I willing to resolve any issues? Were I mindful of how I impacted other people? And did it affect my service? And that's what the letter is all about. It's about forgiveness, reconciliation. And we come to think about these matters of forgiveness and reconciliation. We're always thinking about the sacrifice of Christ. He who did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself and suffered even to the point of death on a cross. He who knew no sin became sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So this is a big illustration of, of Christ's forgiveness. Because Paul is acting in the middle as a mediator between a runaway and a master. And that's the same as we. We're rebelling against Christ, uh, rebelling against our maker. And we have a mediator, which is Christ, reconciling us back to our rightful masters. Because we either are going to be slaves to sin, as Romans 6 says, we already are without Christ, or we're going to be slaves to Christ. We close the letter now, and we're going to be thinking about the the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So we've been learning about forgiveness, children, and about reconciliation. And we now, I don't know, you've been witnessing us partaking of this bread and this cup, and you've been taught about what it means. And this is a time we come together to ponder and examine ourselves as well as remember Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection, his sacrifice, his own body broken, it was his real body, Olivia and Lola, do you know? He really suffered. And it was real blood. It was very, you know, that he could have snapped his fingers and everything will be finished. But he saw the joys that will come with the sacrifice of having us forgiven and being with him in heaven. And he went. He went quietly, obediently. And we are told by Paul in 1 Corinthians as he's almost telling off the Corinthians for getting drunk and, and partaking of the bread in an unworthy manner, he's telling them to examine themselves before they would uh, eat the bread and drink the cup. And I think it's always good to examine ourselves because sometimes we can blitz into God's presence and not even think about our anxiousness, our worry, which is sin, anything that's distracting us. Even our children can come in between us and God. We can have them highly. Uh, they can distract us. So let's just examine ourselves. I'm going to read verses 27 and 29 of 1 Corinthians 11, which is Paul admonishing the Corinthians there of what they're doing wrongly, using this as an opportunity to get drunk and do it in an unworthy manner. And this is what he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 27, 29. 
Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's a big warning. Judgment on yourself. So let's examine ourselves for a moment. And uh, remember that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let's have a few minutes to meditate. Paul says to Jesus on the night before he was betrayed, when he was with disciples, said this, For I received from the Lord what I also have passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. This is the body. It's not the actual body. We do it in remembrance of Christ. We break it just like he was broken at the cross. And we just remember that his own body, his own body, which it should have been our body, was broken on our behalf. And this body now will be reminded not only of his death, but all of his forgiveness that is in this death. Jason, would you pray for the bread before I hand it out? Our great God, we thank you so much that even as we who love you represents many families in Christ, in your family, God, we are but one family. And we have different ways of serving you in this one family. But this is only possible because of the one body of the Lord Jesus Christ and how that one body was offered up in our place. We did not offer a lamb as the faithful Israelites did in Egypt on the night of their release from their slavery. And as the faithful Israelites had been doing every year for the next 1500 years, we now remember how you, God, gave your son, your firstborn, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And we thank you for that one for all time sacrifice. Jesus gave himself in his human body that hurts the same way ours hurts, that feels tiredness the same way that ours feel tiredness. He was tempted as we are tempted, but never sinned mm. so he could be that pure and perfect sacrifice mm. we thank you for jesus christ the lamb of god jesus christ the bread from heaven the jesus christ lord and savior who came to rescue to save even us mm. and because of what he did we have hope he is our peace mm. he has made peace between us and you holy god by receiving our sin upon him there on that cross where it was paid for, even, even by his death. We thank you for the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and the, the bread that we will partake of now, which reminds us of that body of his, that sinless, perfect body offered in our place. Mm. We thank you, Father, for Jesus. Amen. 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 If you are a believer, or if you have, if you don't have any unconfessed sin, you're free to take the bread and try to remind yourself of the reason why we do this is to remember Christ's body. John 6, 33 to 35, for the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never thirst. That's Jesus saying. Let's partake the bread together.
the same way, after supper, he took the cup saying, this is the new covenant, my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. We look at the cup as a symbol of Christ's own blood that was shed on our behalf. The Bible tells us that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. We told that there's greater love. There's no greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends in John 15, 13. And we told that God him, made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. As we take this blood, this wine, we remember his sacrifice again until he comes. Let's drink together. Actually, uh, Andrea, could you pray for the cup, please? Father, it is an immense privilege to be found around your table today. Thank you for the And Lord, we just remember what you did, what you did for us. You suffered in the darkest place, a place of unimaginable suffering. That it was dark because then we could see what went on as God's wrath was poured out on you for us, so that we could be set free. And we don't drink a, a bitter cup this morning, we drink a sweet cup because Jesus lives. So we just thank you, Lord, for your life. We thank you for your death. And we just pray, Lord, that you would continue, Lord, with us in, throughout this week. In the, it, it says in a famous hymn, but let me um, be found near the cross and shed some, let me remember the scenes of the cross day by day. That we remember, Lord, the holy lives. So thank you now for that sacrifice and that blood that you shed for us. It was not cheap. Amen. As you drink and remember Jesus' blood on the cross, I'll read a portion of Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53, starting in verse 3. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb, a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And he in the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. Dear God, we do recognize that it was not for your own benefit that you go to the cross, but for our own. Lord, you, it was our sin that made it necessary for you to be stricken at the cross. It was our sin that put you there, Lord. And all of it because you were loving and merciful God. We... As we take these elements, we are remi reminded of this great gift of yours, the gift of salvation, eternal life. Lord, with so many wars happening, we 
fret and get anxious and fear. But yet, Lord, our lives are hidden in Christ. We are safe and there's nothing that can take us out of your hand, Lord. Thank you for rescuing us, for redeeming us. We pray that this will be one true one day of our children. As they hear our, the parents having this, uh, eating this bread and drinking this cup, they'll be reminded that it will be reminded to them of the great sacrifice that was done for, for all of those who believe. And it is our prayer, Lord, that you have mercy on them just like you had mercy on us. We pray and thank you, Lord, for the sacrifice you made. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. I pray now that as we start the week afresh with the mercies that are new every morning, that this won't be the last time we remember this sacrifice, but daily we'll come to your cross repentant and putting our trust completely at the sacrifice you've done for us. So hear us, help us, fashion us to be the men and women you want us to be because we ask it for your glory. Amen. Amen.